Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, I think uh, Remembrance Day, Memorial Day, Veterans I think these, these holidays, whatever you want to refer to them as, I think they're more important than ever, especially with all of the conflict going around in the world and the fact that a lot of the West um, in Europe and uh you know north america we've been so far removed from such horrific conflict um obviously what's going on in ukraine what's going on in uh between uh ukraine and russia between israel and uh hamas this stuff is horrifying but i don't think we quite a lot of us understand just how much more horrifying it can get um so yeah, we're we're gonna watch this. Uh, n not the whole hour and thirty eight, but a good chunk of it. All right, let's go, guys. I hope you're all doing well. And did not, and did not come home. The weather is not ideal in London. The rain has just started at Whitehall. And perhaps a chance to reflect upon the conditions that the armed forces and civilian forces faced during the First World War, the Second World War, and many other conflicts since. Marching across is the garrison sergeant major who has been organizing all the elements of remembrance here in London these last few days. Just before 11 o'clock today, the King will come with members of the royal family and will lead the nation. Watching are those people who take part in preparing this every year with some of the veterans who are unable to face the weather. And some of those who are gathered here are over 100 years old and took part in the Second World War, as the mass bands begin their program of music with Rule Britannia. The Director of Music, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Burringer, who is the commanding officer of the Household Division's bands. He will lead the music. He's guided by lights to get the timing exactly right. square that's created here by the armed forces. There are 800 overall from the armed forces and those civilian services that are taking part. The Royal Navy, the senior service, joined also by the Royal Marines, the Army, the Royal Air Force, the police and the Merchant Navy. To the right of our picture, we see the buglers of the Royal Marines and the trumpeters of the Royal Air Force, who will play respectively the last post and the rouse 
during the coming two-minute silence. The Minstrel Boy was a song well known in Ireland, written by Thomas More, and it held in its own way an echo of those lands who we remember today. siege of any in the United Kingdom in between the years 1461 and 1468, echoing that great Welsh tradition. the weather rolls in from the Atlantic, we recall that this is the 80th anniversary of the Battle of the Atlantic, probably the longest campaign in the Second World War. In its 72,000 Royal Navy and Merchant Navy sailors were killed by drowning. 6,000 Royal Air Force Coast Command also lost their lives. The United Kingdom lost 3,500 ships and 175 warships, trying to make sure that Britain did not starve. The Sky Boat Song, which takes us to the north and to the highlands and out to the islands on the west coast. The pipes and drums of number 12 company, Irish Guards. Also this year, we'll be recalling the 70th anniversary of the Korean War Armistice Agreement, and a reminder of so many veterans from that time who will be gathered watching and who will be remembering what was, to some extent, a forgotten war coming relatively soon after the great dramas and trials of the Second World War. We will also be recalling this year the 20th anniversary of operations in Iraq. And 80 years ago, the bravery of Op Chastise, which was the Royal Air Force's incredible operation to destroy the dams. Airbus of the Rhine Valley and known and remembered as the Dam Busters.
haunting tune there of Isle of Beauty from which the phrase fare thee well comes as it now moves us back to Wales again with David of the White Rock. Nine D-Day veterans take part in the service. I, I, I just don't, I want to, I just want to say, I'm not going to talk very much at all. I just want to observe and I'm, I'm happy we have the guy explaining it. So I hope that's not, that's all right. Outside the lines of smartly dressed servicemen and women, and also those from the civil services, we see an enormous crowd of onlookers who have gathered here. Some of them queued very early this morning in order to get their picture of this scene with the cenotaph at the center, and where shortly we will see representatives of the Commonwealth, of the dependent territories, and of course of our own politicians, then to be joined by the king and the royal family. And on the side of the cenotaph, the white ensign of the Royal Navy, the Union flag and the blue ensign of the auxiliary forces. But placed at the top, carved into the stone, is the empty tomb, the cenotaph, where all of us can place our thoughts today. Flowers of the forest, which remind us of the Battle of Flodden, when so many Scots were killed in battle, and remembering all the souls that were lost in that battle back in the 16th century. Perhaps one of the most evocative of tunes played at the funeral of so many Scottish service men and women. The representatives of the Royal British Legion from different parts of the United Kingdom, from different services, who have organised this event now take their place with all those who have gathered of the veterans. 
and it's a chance to follow them through to where an enormous phalanx of nearly 10,000 veterans have gathered today. They come from 304 armed forces and civil organizations, and for the first time this year, about 300 who don't have an organization to march with, but who will be taking part anyway. Because for those who have served, or for the families of those who have served, the chance to march by the cenotaph and pay respect is profound. Listen to the music of Elgar's Nimrod as we watch this scene prepare for the two minute silence. And all the way up to Trafalgar Square, the lines of the columns of veterans. They have come to pay their respect. They have lived through interesting times. And for them, they bring in their minds the memories of so many who cannot be here today. And they bring those memories out of deep respect and a determination to always remember. It is also the 75th anniversary of the Windrush arrival, those who had served during World War II and who played their part in the protection of the United Kingdom and its then empire. As the bishop's procession now leaves the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, 
the cross of the Chapel's Royal, carried by Matt Davies. Ten children of the Chapel's Royal and six gentlemen of the Chapel's Royal and their director of music. To the music when I am laid in earth from Dido's Lament by Purcell. The words, remember me, remember me, but oh, forget my fate. And marching to take their positions, the Major General commanding the Household Division, his chief of staff and aide de corps. Major James Bowder, Major General James Bowder, who is the Major General commanding the Household Division. His chief of staff, Colonel Guy Stone, whose brother works for Sky News and is currently covering the war in Gaza from Jerusalem. And the aide de corps, Captain Max Brewer. The first aid nursing yeomanry, the women who did so much, particularly in the Second World War, the predecessors of these fine volunteers, particularly behind enemy lines with the Special Operations Unit, as the Prime Minister <clears throat> and the senior politicians me, yes. take their position. With former Prime Ministers who gather here too, but it is on the shoulders of those who lead the political parties today that decisions on the use of armed forces around the world always rests, as this democracy has always insisted that it is through the parliamentary process that these decisions are taken. Chief of the Defence Staff, the First Sea Lord, the Chief of the General Staff, and the Chief of the Air Staff. On whose shoulders rests the operational capability of the armed forces, and when told to carry out whatever military operation is required. And representing history, representatives not only of Nepal and Ireland, but of all the Commonwealth, who in their different ways were affected by the First and Second World War and many conflicts since. And it will be their wreaths that will turn this Portland Stone Memorial into the red of memory through the poppies.
passing through the doors of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, representatives from the wide range of different faiths throughout the United Kingdom who also come to take part in this service in the act of remembrance. And the Bishop of London waits to lead that service with the children of the Chapel's Royal later on. As everything is set and the armed forces are brought to attention for the arrival of His Majesty the King and the Royal Family. And the Queen will appear at the balcony to look down upon this somber scene of reflection. She will be joined by the Princess of Wales, by the Duchess of Edinburgh and other members of the royal family as His Majesty the King now leaves to take his place by the Cenotaph. The King and the Royal Family have taken their places at the Cenotaph. His Majesty will lead the nation in the National Act of Remembrance. And a reminder that the Cenotaph represents an empty tomb, so that anyone, you, can place your thoughts in it during the two-minute silence.
Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Thompson presents to His Majesty the King's Wreath, which is laid by him on behalf of the country. On behalf of Her Majesty the Queen, her wreath will be laid by her equerry, Major Ollie Plunkett. Guys, I just, I, my eyes, I just need to put eye drops. I feel like I barely blink. Doesn't like, feel right. The Prince of Wales, with the three feathers of the heir apparent upon his wreath, lays it beside the king's and will also salute. Captain Christopher Brinkman of the Royal Wessex Yeomanry hands the Duke of Edinburgh his wreath. <clears throat> Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal receives hers from Commander Anne Sullivan. She has just taken on responsibility as president of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, which tends for eternity the graves and memorials of those who lost their lives in the First and Second World War and beyond. And on behalf of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Kent, whose father was killed in the Second World War, in an air accident in Sutherland in Scotland. Captain George Hopkins, his equerry, lays the wreath. <coughs> and Major William Harris of the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards will stand the parade at ease. And with the start of the funeral march number one in B flat minor by Beethoven. The Right Honourable Rishi Sunak will lay his wreath. Majesty's opposition and leader of the Labour Party, the Right Honourable Sir Keir Starmer, places his also aside the base of this remarkable memorial. the Scottish National Party and Plaid Cymru Parliamentary Group, Mr. Stephen Flynn plays a wreath.
the leader of the Liberal Democrats, the Right Honourable Sir Ed Davey. of the Democratic Unionist Party, the Right Honourable Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. of the House of Commons and all members of Parliament, the Speaker, the Right Honourable Sir Lindsay Hoyle. of the House of Lords, the Lord Speaker, the Right Honourable the Lord McFall. And together, James Cleverly, Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Affairs, and the Right Honourable Suella Braverman, Secretary of State for the Home Department, will lay wreaths on behalf of the intelligence agencies. Overseas territories and Crown dependencies will step forward to lay their wreaths. They represent the Bailiwick of Guernsey, the Bailiwick of Jersey, the Isle of Man, Anguilla, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, the Falkland Islands, Gibraltar, Montserrat, St. Helena, Ascension, and Tristan de Cunha. And Turks and Caicos. In this period of the wreath laying, we recall how far and wide was the reach of the First and Second World War, and how great the responsibility of those who had to fight for freedom in it. Representing Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Ghana, and Malaysia.
stand along with them. Nigeria, Cyprus, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Uganda and Kenya. And although not a part of the Commonwealth at the moment, we also recall those who lost their lives in these wars from Zimbabwe. nations of Malawi, Malta, which won the George Cross from George VI for its bravery in the Second World War, Zambia, the Gambia, Singapore, a scene of such tremendous battles for which many of the veterans are perhaps watching now, Guyana, Botswana, Lesotho and Barbados. The steps of Lutchen's great memorial here in the center of Whitehall, gradually filling with the memories of nations around the world. Mauritius, Eswatini, formerly Swaziland, Fiji, Bangladesh, the Bahamas, Grenada. Papua New Guinea, the Seychelles, Commonwealth of Dominica, St. Lucia and St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. Final group, 10 of the High Commissioners on the east side of this memorial, representing Belize, Antigua and Barbuda, the Maldives, St. Christopher and Nevis, Brunei, Dar es Salaam, Cameroon, Mozambique, Rwanda, Garbo and Togo. representing the unique relationship that the United Kingdom has. The ambassadors of Ireland, our closest neighbor, and Nepal step forward with all the associations with the Gurkhas who have for so long fought beside the armed forces of the United Kingdom in the pursuit of peace. The armed forces, led by the Chief of the Defence Staff, Admiral Sir Tony Radekin, the First Sea Lord, Sir Ben Key, Chief of the General Staff, General Sir Patrick Sanders, and the Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal, Sir Rich Knighton.
four commanders who right now are involved with supporting some of the challenges that face our allies around the world. And on behalf of the civil services, Mr. Jeffrey Nutt from the Merchant Navy, who we recall with the Battle of the Atlantic, the Air Transport and Auxiliary Association, and the civilian services. The Lord Bishop of London. O oh, Almighty God, grant we beseech thee that we who here do honour to the memory of those who have died in the service of their country and of the Crown may be so inspired by the spirit of their love and fortitude that forgetting all selfish and unworthy motives, we may live only to thy glory and to the service of mankind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O oh God, our help in ages past. Teach us, good Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to speak for rest, to labour and not to ask for any award save that of knowing that we do thy will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Unto God's gracious mercy and protection we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and always. Amen. The rose will be followed by the national anthem, God Save the King.
With a salute, the King will take leave of this scene of national remembrance and lead the royal family back to the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Whenever a serviceman or woman is killed, either in active service or just in the passage of normal training, the king is always informed. Members of the royal family have associations with regiments, with squadrons, with ships, all across the globe as they serve. The Chapel's Royal, led by the Sergeant of the Vestry and the Bishop of London, who is Dean of the Chapel's Royal and the Sub-Dean, existed for medieval monarchs to take with them when they traveled away from the country in order to maintain their religious devotion. Henry V took the children of the Chapel Royal to the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. For the Prime Minister and for all those who represent the principal parties of the United Kingdom in the House of Commons, the burden of whatever comes in the coming year sits heavy. And for Prime Ministers who in the past made decisions about sending service people to battle. Their responsibility and reflection must also carry its own burden. Ministers and representatives of London, including the mayor, filing back to their duties in Parliament and wherever they represent people leaving the armed forces on duty to stand ready for whatever challenge may come. We have remembered them. And as time ticks by, the solid stone memorial that holds up the empty tomb remains at the heart of London life, remembered for its purpose today, always holding the thoughts of a nation from generation to generation. Whoever the speaker is here, narrator, super good. For the Chiefs of Staff of the Armed Forces, returning to their duties in the knowledge that up and down the country, sailors, soldiers and aviators have played their part. The veterans have gathered, the cadets have played their part too in remembering. Shortly, the parade will be handed over to the Royal British Legion. And the veterans will have their chance to march past the memorial where those who lead our nation have paid their respect. The Major General commanding the Household Division, Major General James Bowder, his Chief of Staff, Colonel Guy Stone, and his aide de camp, Captain Max Brewer, leave the parade ground, which marks the end of His Majesty's parade. And the armed forces stand at ease. And stand easy.
who is this guy? What's this role? Yeah. And the trumpet voluntary by Clark. And as this well-known tune rings out in Whitehall this morning, on behalf of the Royal British Legion, its president, Vice Admiral Sir Clive Johnson, takes his wreath and will step forward to place it at the cenotaph. And he does so for all those who've been selling poppies in every town, city, and village, and railway station, and airport around the country. And one remembers the poppy factory, both in London and in Edinburgh, where veterans work throughout the year to prepare the poppies for the coming year, and what that represents in terms of supporting those veterans who have, for whatever reason, the need of that help. For the Royal Naval Association, shipmates Stanley, Keith, Ridley. The anchor that holds the ship in the windy turmoil of the sea, anchoring our thoughts for those who served in the Royal Navy today. Benevolent Fund, the Soldiers' Charity, General Sir James Everard lays his wreath. veterans who have kept the skies safe, particularly those still living from the Second World War. The Royal Air Forces Association, their wreath laid by Air Commodore Stu Stirrett. Services League. General Lord Richards of Hurst Manso, who was once Chief of the Defence Staff. Also played his part as Chief of the General Staff with many other very senior military appointments. He now sits in the House of Lords and represents many issues on behalf of the armed forces. Legion Scotland with the wreath marked by St. Andrew's Cross, the Saltai, laid by Lieutenant Commander retired Martin Hawthorne. of Scotland laid here at the steps of the Cenotaph.
remembering the impact of the Blitz upon London for Transport for London, Wing Commander Brian Everett. And the use by so many people who lived in London of the underground system as a place to hide from the relentless bombing of the Blitz. But it has been a remarkable marking this year in the coronation year of His Majesty the King. Laura, you were there. How did it come across? Well, I can say one thing, which is that the rain clouds have lifted now, and that has certainly lifted the mood of the thousands of people who are gathered here along Whitehall. This is a huge day, isn't it? Not just for the veterans here, but a very significant day for the royal family. Today we saw the king performing perhaps what is the most important duty in his calendar. Of course, he's been here for many, many years, but last year was his first as monarch. And again, this year, laying that wreath on behalf of the United Kingdom and the countries of the Commonwealth as he is, of course, their commander-in-chief of the armed forces. And I think you always get a sense, I think, of, of the moment, the significance. It's not lost on anyone here. And certainly, looking at the faces of the members of the royal family who are here, the senior politicians, the dignitaries, that moment isn't lost on them. That moment, though, now over, and really, as the silence, the ceremony ends, you can hear the noise building along Whitehall now, that sea of umbrellas we saw earlier all put to one side, because I think at the heart of today is very much the veterans. Nearly 10,000 are here, I mean, including remarkably a 100-year-old um, who will be marching with nine D-Day veterans. And he's Joe Randall marching with the spirit of Normandy Trust. An absolutely incredible moment for him and the other D-Day veterans, but for all the veterans here. And it was interesting, a little earlier I was speaking to some of the people who've gathered to watch the march past, many of whom are the significant others of those taking part. And one wife of someone in that march line up there was saying to me the moment her husband opened the envelope and realised he could take part a while back, she said tears formed in his eyes. This is an emotional day. It's an important day. I think it is the absolute recognition, I think, of service and, of course, of, of sacrifice too. And she said to me there will be a tear in her eye too as he walks towards the cenotaph and salutes at the cenotaph as well. It is a very moving scene here, but like I say, they've stood for a long time. The veterans here. Um, my, my great uncle died um, getting off the boats on Omaha Beach. They, they, they know kind of where you died based on your dog tag, I guess. And I visited his grave twice. Such a powerful experience. Give a little salute to him dying, um, dying on D-Day. The excitement, I think we can call it that, is now building. They are ready, raring to go for this moment. And it is an honour. There is a ballot to take part. Like I say, nearly 10,000 will be taking part, including 800 current serving members of the armed forces as well. And the crowds, nine, ten people deep either side of Whitehall, to watch this moment as well. And we've been reflecting as well as along with the, the, the sombre remembrance here, there is a much tighter security presence too, but it has done little to deter the people coming. This is a, a safe area now for them to pay their respects. And these veterans now getting ready to do just that as they will soon be walking past the cenotaph. But it's been an incredibly busy time for the safe place to King as well passed the cenotaph. <laughs> but it's been an incredibly busy time for the king as well, only just returned from his state visit to Kenya. And of course, next week, getting ready to celebrate his 75th birthday. 
on the day itself he will be joined by others who are turning 75 this year for a tea dance at Highgrove. So from one state visit to a big ceremonial event to a big birthday celebration as well, a reminder that the royal calendar always busy, but this certainly, as I said, one of the most important duties of the King's Year, Alistair. And we've just seen the War Widows Association uh, had their special white cross of chrysanthemums placed at the foot of the cenotaph. It always is very evocative to see that very simple white cross of chrysanthemums. And remembering all those widows who lost their husbands in battle. And it was in the 1970s that an Australian widow came over to the United Kingdom and campaigned for her war widow's pension to be tax-free like it is in Australia and the War Widows Association gathered and they have been permitted to place their very special and emotional wreath of chrysanthemums here. And it makes one think. Yeah, it does. of the Irish Guards are playing as we prepare now the columns of veterans who will march past. We saw some of the King's Scouts taking their position to support those members of the Royal British Legion who will be helping to move the enormous number of wreaths that will be passed to them by the passing marching veterans. And they will all be placed as close as they can be to those of the Commonwealth political military and royal wreaths, and that parade is about to begin. And with a salute to the Fallen, the drum major, leading the Coldstream Guards band, the Irish Guards in there too, with senior members of the Royal British Legion, a lot of removing of bowler hats and caps in salute with an eyes left. And at the head of column A, the Gurkha Brigade Association, we saw the ambassador of Nepal laying a wreath, a recognition of the service, not only of them, but of the British Gurkha Welfare Society. I had the privilege of serving with the Gurkhas when they were with us down in the Falklands in 1982, and I've seen many Falklands medals amongst those marching beside the Senator just there. And then the Grenadier Guards Association, the Coldstream, Scots Guards, Irish Guards, Welsh Guards, and the London Regimental Association marching past. particular, the Royal Regiment of Scotland and its antecedent regiments march past giving their salute. And each of those medals tells an enormous story. And I'm sure many of those stories will be told later on when all these veterans get to the pubs of London. Oh my God, if I can... 
Imagine me going and having drinks with them and that. Oh, my God. Uh, but you know, we're gonna, you know, watch a few. So amongst these groups, we've got the Royal Scots Regimental Association, the King's Own Scottish Borderers, the Black Watch Association, the King's Own Scottish Borderers, and joined by the Black Watch and the Queen's Own Highlanders, the Fraserburgh, Macduff, and Northeast Gordon Highlanders. As the music says, it is indeed a long way to Tipperary. And for those First World War veterans who formed this parade, many of these tunes marched them to the front and to the trenches and back again for a spot of leave in the long misery of the Great War. You guys, I'm gonna, I can make the parade all a separate video, um, all right, but I'm gonna cut it here just so when I have the ceremony. Um, you know, it, it, you don't have too much to, to scroll through there. I just, it, it seems very different this, this time around. Um, I'm afraid when people die, who, who think that the worst can happen is in what's happening in Gaza or what's happening in, or in Israel or what's happening in Russia or Ukraine, all horrific things which are very, in any time period, horrific and things. I think as these people pass away, and there is no one left that has seen the scale of warfare, where everyone is 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 in the game, and 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 so many people die horrifically, that I feel like when they pass away, the the timer starts ticking until the next giant ruthless event um anyone who served i just thank you and or knows anyone or, or whatnot just very powerful video thank you guys um i'd appreciate any i i didn't talk and I, I didn't i didn't really plan but i i was captivated it was a lot of help from the spokesperson and um yeah it was a, that, that was an hour and 12 minutes, too. If, if, usually I can't sit still for more than, like, 10 minutes. Um, yeah, just amazing. Happy Remembrance Day. The, you, you guys are going to... It's not going to come out until tomorrow, Monday. But um, Sunday right now. Yeah, I, we, we can't ever forget this, no matter how much division or whatnot. At the end of the day, countries die that was a bad nothing lasts forever and and making sure we know that it's people who sacrifice themselves who we're so lucky to be removed from and don't even think about most of the time unless you have a family member and live this great life then when you be become so removed you, you don't even think that you think like oh I, that, that like, you start to complain about more mundane things. And I think days like today is when everyone needs to stop talking about any non-life-threatening wartime thing and, and sit back and remember. Remember what people can do to each other, what I can do to you, what you can do to me, what humans are capable of doing. And remember... Remember, remember. Um, thanks for watching along with me, guys. Uh, and I'll, I will see you next time. Bye, guys. Love y'all.